12 Ways in Which Satan Messes With Jesus' Followers A Bible Teaching Followers of Jesus must face up to their enemy, Satan, who often deceives them, seeking to destroy their witness, and to kill their body. The New Testament reveals Satan's tactics, along with effective defense measures against him. 1. Satan can lead followers to change their allegiance from Christ to him. The devil said, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Your best defense remains to worship and serve only the Lord your God. 2. Satan can fill a follower's heart to lie to the Holy Spirit about financial dealings. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to man but to God. Your best defense remains to show generosity. 3. Satan can put it in a follower's heart to betray Jesus. The devil put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. Your best defense remains to keep yourself clean. 4. Satan can tempt to sexual sin, followers who lack self-control. Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Your best defense remains for married couples to dwell together. 5. Satan can lead followers astray from truth about Christ. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray, from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Your best defense remains to warn against false teaching about Jesus, his spirit, and his good news. 6. Satan can turn a follower's human anger into sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Your best defense remains to forgive one another. 7. Satan can frustrate followers' missionary plans. We wanted to come to you, I Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Your best defense remains to send a co-worker. 8. Satan can puff up leaders with conceit. An overseer must not be a recent believer, lest he become puffed up with conceit, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Your best defense remains to choose as leaders, those who remain above reproach. 9. Satan can ensnare leaders with disgrace. An overseer may fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Your best defense remains to choose as leaders, those who are well thought of by outsiders. 10. Satan can cause doctrinal controversies amongst followers. Foolish, ignorant controversies, breed quarrels the snare of the devil. Your best defense remains to correct your opponents with gentleness. 11. Satan devours followers who are careless about their faith. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Your best defense remains to resist the devil, firm in your faith. <laughs> 12. Satan draws followers into friendship with the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Resist the devil. Your best defense remains to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you.
those two main kings king Saul who was the first king and the scripture indicates to us he was chosen by people and the king after him was the king David who was chosen by God and King Saul he was a taker even when the description was written about his kingdom it will say he will take your daughters he will take your possessions he will take your lands he will take your taxes he will take but David from the beginning to the end of his life we saw always David gave he gave his life to try and rescue the sheep to try and rescue Goliath and to try and rescue people from the Goliath and continued on to risk his life to protect the people of God and we see that King Saul he was disobedient to God and in the beginning God causes him to lose a dynasty that means that even when King Saul would finish his reign his after him none of the people with Saul's name will be able to occupy the throne and then Saul continues to disobey and God says not only you're losing your dynasty I'm gonna dethrone you and he actually was dethroned for not executing God's judgment on Amalekites and God came through Samuel and says you're no longer a king yet King Saul still continued to rule as though he was a king God removed kingdom from him yet he still exercised authority he still intimidated people and people were still afraid and people were still under his jurisdiction as this was going on that King Saul who was no longer king though he was controlling people on the other side there was a young man named David who was legitimate king but he didn't have a throne and he developed a little huddle a little group that combined themselves with David and they said we will be with him and they lived in exile they were persecuted they were in hardships and eventually King David who had no throne got the throne and Saul experienced his last defeat where he and those who were with him not only lost the dynasty lost the crown but they lost their lives That's exactly what's happening right now. Kingdom of Satan is like the kingdom of Saul. He was with God but he was disobedient and God threw him away from heaven. Defeat number one and then God didn't give him an option of repentance. Sometimes we don't think of that. That with us when we sin God gives us an option chance number two and most of us we used up chances 20,000. Satan didn't have an option that means he has no dynasty he has no future reconciliation with God. God says you're done. Then God sent his son on the cross and Jesus disarms Satan not only in heaven Satan was defeated he was defeated on earth. So now Satan roams around the earth without a crown though he still rules and though he still has quote unquote majority under his spell just like Saul who terrorized people lied to people about David saying David is a bad guy and kept people under his regime threatened people people in their hearts wanted the king David they loved David because he was for them but under the oppression of Saul they served him a king without a crown and that's exactly what's happening today majority of the world today are under the spell and the bible says under the sway of the evil one in their hearts people believe there is a god in their hearts there is a yearning to be with someone who created you but because of this oppression and because satan pretends to be a king and he's no longer is the Bible says that he is the prince of the air but we know that Jesus Christ before he left heaven he said all the authority is mine. That means Satan has been fired. He's running like a chicken without a head. He's still controlling the earth. He's still keeping it under his terror but he has been defeated. Now what I want to present to us today is also want to remind you of Satan's future. Why? Because Satan will remind you of your past. And you have to be sure of his future. 
you have to remind him why because see Satan will remind you of your past and your past is a fact so is his future he will say you did it you're like that's right and guess what's gonna happen to you wait until your future comes your future is nothing compared to my past The Bible says that the kingdom of God will be preached and then the end will come. When I was younger that word scared me because what that meant to me as a young person is that there comes a time a last person gets saved and then we all gonna get shot by the devil and the devil's gonna like torment and hurt us and everything. But if you read book of Revelation you see that the end doesn't come for us. The end comes for the devil God doesn't let the devil go to hell without first bringing hell on the devil. Everything about book of Revelation you see the first it starts with seals. Then goes to trumpets and then goes to bowls. And that's those verses in the Bible you see the horses, you see the earth being turned down and you always see this at the end of every single wrath of God. Is that God was aiming all of his wrath on Satan not in hell on earth because God will do to Satan what happened to Saul he will experience his final defeat on this earth Satan's kingdom is popular but not going to be popular very long even when Saul was popular inside he was terrorized the Bible says inside Saul during his last battle he went to a witch doctor and he was scared for his life and the Bible tells us that Satan also is scared knowing his time is short. Though he has everything under his fingertips inside he knows God is right and he is like a race car racing really fast to a cliff. His kingdom no matter how popular it is is going to be doomed. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who the fourth man is. In Genesis he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus the Passover lamb. In Leviticus our high priest. In Numbers the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua the captain of our salvation. In Judges our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles our reigning king. In Ezra our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther our Mordecai. In Job our day spring on high. And our ever living redeemer for I know that my redeemer liver. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who he is. In Psalms he's the Lord our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah the prince of peace. In Jeremiah the righteous branch. In Lamentations the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel the fourth man the burning fiery furnace. Who is this fourth man? In Hosea he's the faithful husband forever married to the backslider. In Joel the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos our burden bearer and Obadiah the mighty to save. In Jonah our great foreign missionary. In Micah the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk God's evangelist is crying revive thy work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah he is the Savior. In Haggai the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who is this fourth man? In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, the wonder worker. In Luke, the son of man. In John, the son of God. In Acts, the Holy Ghost. In Romans, our justifier. Corinthians, our sanctifier. In Galatians, he is the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, the God who supplies all our needs. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. First and second Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. In first and second Timothy, our mediator between God and man. In Titus, our faithful pastor. In Philemon, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, the blood of the everlasting covenant. And James, the great physician. First and second Peter, the chief shepherd who soon shall appear with a crown of unfading glory. In first, second, and third John, he is love. In Jude, the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. In Revelation, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is this fourth man? I'll tell you who he is. He's able to sacrifice. 
Noah's rainbow, Abraham's ram, Isaac's wells, Jacob's ladder, Issachar's burdens, Judah's scepter, Balaam's Shiloh, Moses' rod, Elijah's mantle, Elisha's staff, Gideon's fleece, Samuel's horn of oil, David's slingshot, Isaiah's fig pole, Hezekiah's sundial, Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchief's and apron, Stephen's signs and wonders, John's pearly white city. Who is this fourth man? He's a husband to the widow, a father to the orphan, to those of us who travel the dark night. He's the bright and morning star. To those who go through the lonesome valley, he's a lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the staff of life, and honey in their eye. Who is this fourth man? He's a rock in the weary land. He is a pearl of great pride. He is the everlasting father, and the garment of our life is upon his shoulder. Who is this fourth man? He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God.